Lawyers used to let you clean up the mess Just down on my knees, thought I couldn't stand up on my own Turns out sometimes you're stronger alone My name is Tara, I'm 38 years old I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I am shunned All right, Tara, so how'd you come to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? Um, so I was born into the religion uh, my parents joined in the 70s. I'm the youngest of three. Yeah, my whole life. <laughs> okay. Uh, you say your parents joined in the 70s. Was that uh, in any way related to 1975? You know, they never actually talked about that specifically, but my they got baptized like 73, 74. So mm -hmm. I've always kind of wondered. Um, they were definitely very vulnerable at that time in their life. They were both raised really dysfunctional families, um, got pregnant, dropped out of high school. Both my parents were like heavy into drugs and yeah, had two babies by age like 19. Mm. So yeah, like very, very vulnerable. Um, my aunt, my great aunt, my dad's aunt started calling on them when they were like 18. She just would like kind of like go in and be like, hey, it's time to go to the meeting. And they would just go with her because they didn't want to be disrespectful. But definitely hippies, like old school hippies. <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess being hippies, I'm sure the utopia of a new system sounded like a good thing to them. Yeah, like Paradise. my parents were like, we're from Canada, but my parents were cheering on draft dodgers and my mom was like very into the feminist movement and Greenpeace and you name it. <laughs> so they were looking to uh, make change in certain ways for the better as they saw it. And uh, mm -hmm. obviously, yeah. I guess Jehovah's Witnesses kind of feel the same, don't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think they were pretty, yeah, like you said, the utopia probably, like, appealed to them a lot. Uh, you would not be the first person on the, on this uh, <laughs> show who had parents who were hippies who were attracted to the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses movement because of that. Uh, yeah. You know, just because they were vulnerable and maybe seeking something and then it is kind of ironic though these it's often people like hippies are kind of anti authority mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and Jehovah's Witnesses are all about authority and dominating yeah. um so <laughs> that that side's interesting as well mhm mm for sure yeah um it surprises me like my mom kind of considers herself like an original feminist and so she always had issues with the elders when we were young um, but I think, I don't, I don't know, that authority also appealed to her. I, I don't know. That sounds weird, but. <laughs> well, yeah, you, it's gotta be kind of hard to be a feminist in a, in an entirely misogynistic or patriarchal <laughs> organization. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where where <laughs> you can't do anything or have a voice or. Uh, that's kind of the antithesis of feminism, I believe. Yeah, it's it's a weird combo. I'm not really sure how that worked out for her, but. Well, uh, I guess she, well, we'll find out as we go how, how the story unfolds. So um, regarding yourself, Tara, so um, you were born into it. It's all you ever knew. Um, what was the worldview it gave, you know, growing up a little Jehovah's Witness kid? How did it make you see yourself and the world around you? Um, definitely scared, like a lot, like really, really scared of Armageddon. Um, I would play like Armageddon with my dolls. I would like huddle in a corner of my room and like try to protect them. And just like a lot of, um, I don't know, like a lot of fear. My mom was very obsessed with like, demons so like there was a lot of talk about demons in my house and just like 
I just remember feeling like on guard all the time, even as a little kid. Um, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I do have a lot of good memories of being a child. Um, but that, that aspect of, yeah, like everyone's going to die. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to die. Is definitely like a theme that ran through my little brain all the time. Well, sure. Um, and we'll get to, <clears throat> as we talk about your family and some other things, I'm sure there were good times. And that's why um, these types of situations are so confusing and abusive at times, is that you can have these good times by the same people who are shoving Armageddon and fear of demons down your throat. Mm -hmm. And it's it's confusing it, to, to have a good time today and then tomorrow to be absolutely terrified and playing armageddon with your dolls so did were your dolls like so i've got to know were your dolls surviving armageddon or were your dolls dying in armageddon <laughs> i don't remember <laughs> i think i think i was saving them i think that's what i was uh, thinking i was saving them oh <laughs> uh, okay okay you were saving them from armageddon all right <laughs> I was going to say, I can see that going a lot of different ways. Uh, yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously, though, you know, as a little kid, uh, you should be playing and you should be ha with your dolls and having fun. Um, but, uh, you know, it's safe to say it's not really normal to grow up as a little kid uh, playing into the world scenarios <laughs> and being afraid of demons. That's... That's not a, a super healthy place to grow up. No. No. Um, so, like, a little background, I guess. I don't know if you're going to get into this more about my family. But mm -hmm. um, so my mom and dad had a very dysfunctional relationship. Um, basically, my mom wore the pants for lack of a better word. Um, my dad's super mellow, super passive. Um, my mom was extremely emotionally abusive to him. So always calling him names, swearing at him, throwing stuff. Um, she always told us kids she didn't want to get married and have kids. So even though like she was a good mom in like a lot of ways, she was very hardworking. She just, there was just this kind of like underlying theme that we were all a burden. And uh, yeah, so there was lots of times where she would just like haul me out and be like, we're leaving and I'm divorcing dad. And like, we would go to my grandma's and, and then two days later, everything was fine. So it was just like a lot of, like a lot of crisis, I guess. I grew up with a lot of crisis, like in my life. And um, yeah, my older siblings, I was definitely closer to them than my parents. They were like my safe place. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it does go to show that even inside the misogynistic and patriarchal uh, cult of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they're. And that, that doesn't mean that there aren't women who feel empowered in certain ways and sometimes in abusive ways themselves. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's all a dysfunctional system. Um, yeah. And it sounds like she really, she really um, was struggling in a lot of ways and uh, mm -hmm. well, hurt people, hurt people. I'm really sorry though. You guys, you know, as kids, you shouldn't grow up feeling like a burden or you know, being drug in and out of these various crises. Um, it's not a, again, not a healthy environment. Yeah, I, I definitely, like my dad didn't really do much in the truth. <laughs> he, I've never seen him give a talk. I've never been in service with him. Um, I think he was more zealous in the beginning. And then he just, I don't know. I think I think he got discouraged because the whole ten hours. If you don't get your ten hours, you know, he got pulled from all his uh, privileges in our little small town congregation, and I think he just kind of gave up. Gotcha. So, yeah, I'm he was. Sure. He, 
I'm sure feeling not good enough in the congregation didn't add to the way he, you know, or didn't help him with the way he was probably feeling at home. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, so growing up, you know, in that, in, in that environment, um, you, know, you kind of described the tone of the home to some degree, were you all a family, you know, that, at the same time this was all going on, were you all regular at the meetings and out in the field ministry? And did you all give your talks and do all the, you know, JW activities? Yeah. So my dad didn't really do anything. He came occasionally to meetings. I would say he was irregular, right? The term they would say he wasn't totally inactive, but my mom, basically us kids, had to prove that we were always good enough, right? So, like, my brother and sister are 10 and 9 years older than me. Um, They both pioneered right out of high school. You know, we were kind of like... We were kind of like the kids that weren't, like, the elders' kids, but we were, like, really um, looked at as, like, exemplary, all of us, because we were very, like... Yeah, we could comment, we could give talks, you know, we were on assembly parts, not as a family, but us kids, like, we had to toe the line. And we did, and all three of us did. We were, like, praised up and down for our whole lives, basically, that we were just these (laughs) crazy spiritual I don't know. Sure, you all were the golden way. children uh, of sorts. Yeah. So did did you feel extra pressure or was extra pressure applied to you kids because maybe in part that your dad was not as involved? Like, did you feel more pressure? Possibly. I never, I don't know. I don't know how my siblings felt. I was always like mad at my dad because there was this like, atmosphere in the home that he was just a deadbeat which he was not he always worked really hard and he was a good dad in every way except he wasn't on the platform (laughs) you know so maybe that's my mom my mom was just she expected perfection and she would say jump and we would say how high like that's just how our life was you know yeah yeah well, there's a lot of people, you know, I mean, I guess <clears throat> we could have a whole discussion about what defines a good parent and certainly providing for your children, uh, you know, food, clothing, shelter is part of that, but also, you know, being there for them emotionally, um, helping them to figure out who they are, encouraging them to be themselves, certainly telling them that they're good enough uh, would would be a part of good parenting as well. Do you find when you when you look back, um, do you find that it was kind of devoid of the latter? Um, but maybe you all did have some good moments in there where like you all had fun together or did mm-hmm. something that, you know, sometimes those moments even mean more when mm-hmm. you're kind of growing up in a dearth of those types of moments. Yeah, like I don't want to rag on my parents because I definitely love them very, very much. Um, and I'm a mom too, so I know I know how tough it is to you're never gonna make everything perfect for your kids as as much as you try. Um, and yeah, like my family, even though my dad wasn't super active, we always had people at our house. Um, my siblings, again, they were quite a bit older, so I was kind of the little mascot for all the teenagers, and we'd have people over play games, and, you know, my parents were very sociable, so, like, I'm pretty lucky the congregation that I grew up in was small-ish, it was about 120, lots of kids, lots of families, um, everybody just, we, we had dances all the time. You know, like, so I, there was there was a lot of good good times, and um, I spent a lot of time outdoors with my dad. That was kind of his his favorite thing was you know taking us kids fishing and hunting and quadding and 
you know, like we did a lot outdoors and I think that's where my dad definitely thrives is, is in his, that's his element. Mm -hmm. Um, so I definitely can't say like it was all bad. Um, of course, cause nothing's black and white. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that, that you had those good times as well, you know, and, mm. uh, sounds like you had a pretty active congregation of people that like, did you have many friends in the kingdom hall? Do you have a lot of people your age? Um, I didn't have a lot of girls my age until I got into like my like mid to late teen years. Um, but I did have my best friend. We like, he, he was a, a boy. He was a couple years older than me, but we spent tons of time together and like, yeah, he was my best friend. So I guess there was, yeah, maybe in my childhood years, not really many. As I got to be a teenager, then there was a lot of us that were the same age. Okay. And were you all in a, a rural congregation? Were you all in a city back then? No, a very rural. We're about two hours from the closest city. Um, but where I lived when I was growing up, there was about, there was congregations like within an hour radius and everybody kind of hung out together. Oh, okay. So because you all were kind of isolated, you made it a point to come together in various ways, like the dances and different things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like we knew everybody from the surrounding areas. We all kind of hung out and our parents all knew each other. And again, like in our hall, um I think most of the parents came in around the same time. Anybody that was like converts came in in the 70s. And so this was um this was rural Canada? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um and so you all um were experienced I I like that your congregations kind of came together and tried to sounds like have community, uh, not just be segregated into your own little kingdom halls, because I know that some, uh, you know, especially even in cities, a lot of congregations, it's like, I know a lot of my friends who left and moved to other halls. I never saw them again. You know, you, you might see them at a circuit assembly or something, but other than that, you just never really saw each other much. Yeah. Yeah. Like we would, um, like, so this is kind of a funny part of that is that in my area, there's a huge kind of um, legacy witness family and there is a lot of them. Mm, <laughs> like, okay. So like at one point we counted 56 people directly related in our hall. Oh, so your your actual individual congregation was dominated by that family. I mean, that's yeah. about half, right? Yes, like wow. so many. And then they were in other places too. So that could have contributed to like everybody kind of like knowing each other. Hard to say. That makes but, sense. That mm-hmm. makes sense too. Uh, that big mm-hmm. family trying to connect through different congregations um so how did you feel about the meetings and service and all of those types of things did you did you enjoy uh, going to the hall or being active in any way I think I enjoyed the attention you know like I'd give my comments when my mom said I would shoot my hand up at the meeting and she didn't even know what I was gonna say (laughs) I think a lot of parents had kids like that (laughs) I knew how to read when I was like four. So I definitely like excelled at the, you know, um, (laughs) academic part of the meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember being pretty bored, (laughs) but I think I filled that time with like commenting and just getting like attention from people. Um, I started, um, I became an unbaptized publisher when I was nine. And so then I was giving talks and um, I would say like that, that part of it was as, was scary. I had like anxiety about it, but like I would push myself to do it and then I would get all this praise. So then I loved that. (laughs) 
<laughs> so there's reinforcement for all of that, those types of activities, isn't there? Yeah, well, and I couldn't do anything in school. So I like, you know, I always wanted to be in plays or choir or whatever, but couldn't do those things. So <laughs> I found some other way to fulfill myself, I guess. Well, sure. And yeah, and service I pretty much hated from the beginning. <laughs> um then like going out knocking on strangers' doors on Saturday morning, waking them up with a watchtower yeah. magazine. No, and like I like again, I always pushed myself, and maybe that's because I knew that my mom just like that was expected, right? But um yeah, I well, part of it too is like I would get so carsick. So I'd be in the back of some big crown Vic and just sick to my stomach. <laughs> yes. Uh, you mean not just a, a crown Vic. Let's describe it a little bit more. A oh. crown Vic with all the windows up and no air movements uh, <laughs> crammed in the middle of the back seat between, between two large adults. Uh, <laughs> that, exactly. I, I, I remember so I used to get car sick sometimes too. Oh Lord. <laughs> the only thing I loved is our small town got an A and W, and that was a big deal. Like Ooh. we got an A and W in the 90s. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Root beer and burgers. And my mom would let me go and have fries and a root beer, right? So that was mm -hmm. that was what I liked about service. So you got a, you all had a break uh, at some yeah. point that you enjoyed. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. I can definitely yeah. see that. Yeah. And oh, being in a small town, I'm sure that having that A&W itself was just a big deal, right? It's like, yeah. oh, we've got this place to go and enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. I mean, there are good memories when you think back to some of that. I liked break. I like going to McDonald's and stuff. That was fun. Yeah, uh, exactly. Especially when <laughs> I had friends and things like that. Yeah. Um, so you did briefly touch on school. Um, so did you go to regular public school or, and did you do that your entire school career? So I went to public school till grade seven. Okay. Um, elementary school was okay. Like I was, I was like your typical witness kid. I was always witnessing around the holidays and you know, I was very, um, like, I, it, it was nerve wracking. Like, of course, I remember feeling so awkward and stuff. But again, I just pushed myself because it was like, this is the right thing to do. And um, funny story, actually, when I was in grade one, my teacher was really did not like witnesses. So during the anthem at the assemblies, she would put me in the equipment room and shut the door oh gosh <laughs> with like six and then she would bring me out throw you in a closet yeah <laughs> wow my parents found out they were pretty mad so yeah, yeah. Pretty intense i mean come on you gotta you have to know as a teacher that that is not cool that's not okay yeah after my parents talked to her she wasn't allowed to do that anymore but sure I mean, I just went along with it because I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm being persecuted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you're kind of taught that, that to expect that, right? So why would you expect anything better? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, so elementary wasn't terrible. Um, I think, I think maybe it depends on your situation. I think being a little kid when you're a JW isn't the worst because again, that love bombing that like, and again, I, I probably had a pretty good experience as a little kid. Um, it's also all, you know, right. So yeah, you don't know um, if it could have been better or not. It's your norm. True. True. Um, and then, um, grade seven, we, in our town, we all got put into the same junior high. So like all the elementary schools got put into the same junior high and I had always grown up no witnesses in my classes. So I, I go into this junior high. I'm, you know, like, well, well, no, I was 11 when I started grade seven. So I'm very, like, young. 
I was super anxious. Like I just, and I had no friends. So, um, I started, well, I started getting picked on really bad. Um, so like these five boys would like follow me around and like spit spit balls in my hair and like, just, yeah, it was awful. Like I would get to school every day and throw up. Oh, wow. and, yeah. And it wasn't because I was a witness. I don't think anybody knew anything about me because I was so shy. Like I would even eat my lunch in the bathroom by myself, you know? And, uh, finally, well, I'm trying to think now. Hmm. Okay. So I went through grade seven with all of that. And then partway through grade eight, I kind of had like a little rebellion before I got baptized. So I like tried smoking. Um, I dated a boy for like two weeks till my mom found out. Um, and then got caught for all those things. And of course, talked to by the elders. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, how did that go? Not just with the elders, but a mom who demands oh. protection. Oh, it was bad. It was really bad. Like my mom would I didn't know this till later in my adult years, but she would spend the entire day searching for my diary when I was like. 12. So she said, as soon as I would leave the house, she would like scour my room and then find my diary and read it. So it was definitely a very controlling mm -hmm. environment. There was no, your thoughts you know, and feelings are not your own. No, God, no. Yeah. Um, so I kind of had this little rebellion in junior high and then when my, this couple other sisters and I, well, we were, we were baptized, but, um, we got caught smoking. So then we had to sit down with an elder and I was just devastated. Like I was just, I felt like the worst person in the entire world. Um, I didn't even like smoking. I don't even know why I tried it. I tried it twice and I hated it. <laughs> yeah. I guess I was kind of wondering what your little rebellion was about. Was it just, I want to try something or did you feel like you were being pushed or you, so you kind of went in the opposite direction or where did that come from? I think, um, I just, my mom was so controlling, like everything we did was under a microscope, you know, like our home was, I don't know what the word is, disinfected. Like it was just literally it was so clean you you know you were kind of always walking on eggshells around my mom and I think I just I go to junior high I start getting picked on and I'm just like well like I don't know I think I just had this I needed to like do something that was different or or bad like I just wanted to be bad because I just felt so miserable maybe I'm I don't know yeah, you, I mean, you were out of control at home. You're out of control at school. Maybe at least doing those things gave you some feeling of control and independence because these are things you were choosing to do, uh, even if you didn't ultimately like it. You know, I mean, this is kid logic, right? Yes, but, exactly. You know, it, it feels like, well, at least I'm doing something that I want to do. Um, yeah. Because where else do I get that chance? Yeah, it was, it was probably, you know, a screw you to my mom I'm sure mm -hmm. and I think too once you like get out of that little kid phase when you're a JW and you're not so cute and like new anymore you almost and you then you become this awkward teenager and it's like you just kind of get forgotten I think mm -hmm. and I remember the meetings being so painfully boring you know I'm past the point where oh my mom's gonna let me draw at the meetings and I'm <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. so bored well, yeah the the day, negative attention is attention if you were a kid who loved attention and you were getting it <laughs> for all the you know th cute little things you were doing as a j-dub kid now maybe you do go the other way to get attention yeah that's that's possible i haven't really thought about that for a long time but sure. hard to say kids yeah. right yeah kids <laughs> um so so you started having a little rebellious phase that phase then you said that was in grade eight. So did they end up taking you out of school because of that? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, and the, the bullying, I finally came forward about the bullying and it was just, it gotten so bad that I did. It was probably good that I went on homeschooling. Um, the issue with that was that neither of my parents graduated. And now I'm in grade eight and math in Canada in grade eight and nine is pretty challenging. I'm very bad at math. I've always been good at the English and the social and, and some of the sciences, but not math. So I failed my math for both years. So, but my mom just basically said, we're putting you on homeschooling and you're on your own because I can't help you. Um, were you happy to be homeschooled? Because at least it relieved the pressure. Um, yeah. But then at the same time, now you have a new pressure. How in the world are you going to do this school thing? Yeah, I remember it being pretty stressed out about school because, again, I was a very high achiever. You know, to do anything less than perfect was just not acceptable to me ever. <laughs> And uh, I had done really well in, in school up to that point. And then, you know, I'm doing like correspondence homeschooling, but I don't really have access to teachers and I'm struggling with my math. And I mean, going through bullying, the kind of bullying that I had experienced was pretty, it took me a long time to get over that. Um, and then, I don't know, I just, I remember being alone a lot. My siblings had already left home by this point like they're quite a bit older than me and I missed them um I I just yeah I mean and the other thing we lived in the country so we're like you know 15 minutes from town by car and I'm I don't know I just I spent a lot of time alone in grade eight Very and nine isolated. yeah I had a dog <laughs> oh you did okay <laughs> yeah had I had a dog, dog and three cats and I would like run around in the forest with my dog and that's kind of what I did. <laughs> Allow me to break in here for a second. This channel is made possible by you, the listener. If you appreciate what we're doing here, please consider supporting at patreon.com slash shunned or leave a review on iTunes or other platforms, uh, like, and subscribe. All those things help the channel. If you're looking for merch, you can go get some shun swag from the shunpodcast.com website or reach out there to be on the show. If you're looking for more ex Jehovah's Witness content, I'll recommend my first podcast called This JW Life. You can find that on podcast apps as well as YouTube. And if you're feeling stuck in life, struggling to find happiness and community, maybe you're haunted by the past, beating yourself up, unsure of who you are or what you even want out of life now that you've lost this one identity that was given to you by a cult, Reach out through my other sites like xjwhelp.com, that's exjwhelp.com, or storyworkscoaching.com, and let's see about working together to help you find a life that fits you and who you are, maybe for the first time ever. And now, back to our guest. Okay. Um, it is sad, though, you know, you talking about bullying, I think a lot of Witness kids are set up for that because we're yeah. supposed to be so different, right? And if you're the person who's different and there are bullies around, well, they're going to key in on the one person who's different. Right. And, and yeah. a lot of us too, honestly, we're kind of bullied at home uh, mm -hmm. by, I mean, sometimes there was an overtly abusive parent in the home. And, you know, I know in my case, my dad bullied me and then I went to school and I didn't know how to stand up for myself. I didn't know, have any self-worth or self-esteem. And so I went to school and I got bullied there too because, well, <laughs> how was I going to stop it? I, I had not I had never had any power in my life and a lot of authority around me who was bullying me. So, yeah, I went to school and got the same thing. So I think a lot of witness kids get set up for that. Yeah, I, I do agree. Um, I was never really allowed to <laughs> just, just be myself. Like um, my mom always said I had an attitude. So that was always an issue. I had an attitude. I had an attitude. So I wasn't, she said I had an attitude if I wore a hat. So I wasn't allowed to wear hats. And then <laughs> and I'm, I was very tomboy. So like I'd always wear a ball cap. Like I just, that was just me, right? But I couldn't wear a ball cap because I had an attitude. 
So hats are an indicator of an attitude. Wow. It's like you're just looking for something at that point, right? Oh, I mean I know, like I was the kid that my mom could look at me and I would just like be like devastated. Like I was just not like I was a very soft, soft kid, easy to manipulate, probably. Well, I'm sure you had been softened throughout your life. Yeah. Oh. So. <laughs> wow. Well, so um, I guess it was nice to get away from the bullying, but uh, the isolation has to take a toll as well. Yeah. And so this, I was actually thinking when I was reading your questions and really thinking back. So a lot of this led up to my baptism because. So now I'm like 13. Um, I'm alone a lot. Um, pretty very lonely, actually. Um, I'm in this super awkward phase of my life. <laughs> and then something really terrible happened in the town where I live. Um, so there was a young sister who my mom is best friends with her mom. And so she's like 16. I've known her my whole life. You know, like we went to Disneyland together. There's a young brother in the hall who's 23 and he's got a motorbike and super nice guy. Like, you know, no, no like weirdness there. He was just like, hey, all the kids were hanging out. And he's like, hey, do you want to go for a ride on my motorbike? So they made one loop of town and a young driver didn't shoulder check and ran over both of them mm. and killed this friend of mine who's 16 and then killed the the driver of the bike also who's 23 so we had two funerals within a week and it was devastating like for everybody and so then that happened and I, I don't know what was going through my head. I don't remember. But like, I know something clicked and I was just like, I got to get baptized. <clears throat> well, sure. Um, getting baptized is like the way to lock it in to see those people again in the resurrection. Or, you know, getting yeah. baptized makes you feel like you have some control again in another out of control situation. That's like yeah. the right thing to do. It's the thing sometimes that can make the whole congregation come together because now this young person has gotten baptized. It's there's just a yeah. lot of things, a lot of reasons there I could see that a young person might see a need to get baptized after something like that. Yeah. And so then because I, I remember, like, I went through this little rebellion, and I was super bored at the meetings and stuff, and then I get baptized, and it was like, okay, I just was like, I'm giving this 150%, because that's just my personality, <laughs> and I auxiliary pioneered when I was 14, and, like, part of that, I think, was the social aspect, because I never really, really liked service. I hated it. But I liked being around people that wasn't my mom and <laughs> having some, you know, new social situations. And yeah, it's just weird to think back, I guess, like that time in my life. Like, I don't really remember what was going through my head. Do, do you actually remember your baptism uh, much? I mean, was that moment, was it what you you know, hoped or, uh, I think, yeah, like, I was super shy and anxious about it, I hated being, like, having to get dunked in a pool in front of everybody, but then my mom had, like, a party with a cake, and, like, all these people were there, and so that was, like, a big deal. <laughs> Praise and reinforcement again, yes. yes. Exactly, so, um, I don't know, I mean, I was so young, I, I don't, I definitely didn't make a logical decision about it. It was definitely an emotional one. Um, yeah. Um, it's one of those things, you know, a lot of people think back, you know, we were kids getting baptized. 
Um, yeah. Again, how old were you? 13. 13. So, um, yeah, you know, what do you know at 13? Uh, not much, not much context for life. And uh, especially not enough context to make a lifelong forever decision. Um, no. Wouldn't let you get married at 13, but you can sign your life away to Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it's a it's an interesting paradigm, and I uh, I just know a lot of us uh, got sucked in. At, you know, these mm -hmm. early ages, you're there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, yeah, I remember a running theme too in our house was always like, you got to set an example for other people. And it started with my sister, who's the oldest, and, you know, she pioneered right out of high school, got married super young, started having kids. My brother pioneered out of high school. Like, it was just, that was the running theme, was like, you need to set an example. That's what we were always told. And I really felt like that was true. Like, it was up to me, yeah, to be... A spiritual like example which is crazy at that age like 13 <laughs> yeah but they make you feel responsible for the other young people you know yeah i, I know i felt that way mm -hmm. um lots of pressure there to perform and to to be the person and you know and again when you're not getting praise anywhere else in your life that there's at least one path that you can go down to get a little bit of praise here and there um, yeah. And that is to be that example. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was just always trying to prove myself to my mom because um, I'm not saying having high expectations for your kids isn't good. Like I have high expectations for my kids too, but I just think there was so much shame and guilt attached to it. Mostly shame. Um you know, my mom would compare us to other witness kids that were, you know, she thought were more spiritual or their parents were elders. And she just, she just pushed us so hard. And I just think it became about pleasing her. Right. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to make her happy. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's okay to have some expectations for your kids but you're wanting it to be in the context of who your children are mm -hmm. um, and not to force them into a mold that you have determined they should be mm -hmm. and uh you know being able to because you know Jehovah's witnesses are this is the one the only way to be you must be this way yeah. and you must do this thing and there's just no well, who are you? And, you know, helping the kid to figure out who they are and how maybe they want to wear ball caps, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, um, do we have to squash every little bit of individuality out of that kid to make them a little us, you know? That's that's not, yeah. um, it's not reasonable. No, um, and, like, even as a teenager, like an older teenager. So I went back to school in grade 10 and it worked out better because I had like four or five other witnesses that were in school and we were all friends. So we had each other, which was nice. Um, and by that time I was, you know, I cared less about what people thought and I was just going to be this good little witness girl, right? That was my, my entire life was like, you know, I would witness at school and I, you know, like I was just like hyper witness, <laughs> honestly. Um, but we did have fun, like us, us kids, we had a group that, you know, we would play football and we would snowboard together and, you know, we'd have bonfires and nobody drank, nobody, you know, like really got in trouble. We were all pretty on the same page. And so there was a lot of good times. Um, but like, I really excelled in school especially English and um, I joined a creative writing class after school it was only an hour a week and after like three weeks my mom picked me up one day and she was mad at me and she was like and I was like doing really well in the class the English teacher who taught it was like really happy with my my poems and my writing and stuff 
And my mom picked me up and she's like, you're spending too much time with worldly kids. You're not allowed to do this class anymore. And I was devastated because that was the only after school activity, you know, besides hanging out with other witness kids that I could do. And I just, I just kind of, I accepted it. I didn't, you know, balk at it. I just was like, okay, I guess that's the end of that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's sad. It, it's a reason that a lot of uh, ex Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, you know, that I maybe that I've seen in my coaching practice or elsewhere, uh, a lot of us are easily discouraged from things because we try something. And then we've been used to having mom or dad or an elder or somebody swoop in and just crush that little dream real fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so the first time we run up against any resistance, a lot of times, even as adults, it's like, oh, guess I can't do that, <laughs> you know, because that's been our whole life. It's like, well, I wanted to do this. Oh, now you're telling me I can't. Well, I guess I can't. And 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 we had no option to fight for that, right? We were kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We don't know how to fight for the things that we want. Exactly. Um, Yeah. And so then I don't know if you have any other questions for me or you just want me to keep going. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) no, you're good. Um, So, you know, uh, I guess just being, you said that you were 14 and started pioneering. So you Mm -hmm. really, like you said, jumped into it really hardcore real fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so how did things go as you went throughout your teenagerhood? Yeah, so like again, like the little town I grew up in, it was pretty good. I had some friends, especially grade 10 to 12. We were a pretty tight little group. Um and then um <clears throat> my dad got really sick. So my dad worked in the oil patch, which is basically like he was called an operator so he would drive around from well site to well site and sometimes get called out if there was leaks or things like that um but he started like having issues with his health um he would have like dizzy spells and severe joint pain and like really weird symptoms they thought he had ms for a while um turns out he had lyme disease so that's great oh wow yeah, but we spent a lot of time outdoors, right? Um, so anyway, he ended up retiring when he was 45, and that really affected us because um, my my dad made really good money, and then all of a sudden, he had to go on disability. So we had to sell our acreage and move. Um, actually, oh, geez, I, there was another thing happening at this time. <laughs> So my sister, she got married and had, she had already had three kids at this point. And one day she just showed up and told us that her husband was abusing her, like physically. I was about 16 at the time. So she moved in with us and my mom and dad were, it was very devastating for us all because she had like, an eight month old, a two year old and a four year old, three boys. And uh, we all lived in the same town. So anyway, she lived with us for about a week. And then the elders told my parents that they weren't allowed to have her live with us. She had to go to a shelter. What the heck is that? Like in a, a I, I don't. Person. That's. Uh, I don't understand that at all. I don't know. Even maybe I'm wrong, and um, so someone who, who who is well versed in I don't know th- those uh, rules and regulations. Maybe there was an elder's letter on this at some point. But how in the world can you not house your own daughter and her and grandkids? Who are being abused by their husband? Is that like seen as taking sides or something? That is insane. Yeah. So my parents listened. My mom was pissed. Oh, my, my mom was, I don't blame her. I'd be mad too. Sure. But they didn't know what to do. And it basically split our congregation in two. It was like Brad and Angelina. <laughs> oh, was she, can I ask, was she married to a brother from the prominent family? No, no, she wasn't. Okay. I was wondering, cause that would easily split it. <laughs> but. 
I mean, there was a lot of nepotism and stuff in our hall, but no, this was just weird. It was like, it was like half were like believing my sister and half weren't. Um, so I'm like 16 at the time. My dad starts getting sick and my parents stopped going to meetings. So I went by myself at like 16. I had my own car and I would drive from like an out of town and go to the meetings. And I went by myself for close to a year. And then, and then finally, when my dad had to go on permanent disability and my sister went back to her husband, we'll get to more of this later, but uh, she went back and my parents just, I don't know, they just kind of crashed mentally, which uh, there was a lot of like really tough stuff going on. So we moved to the town where my brother and his wife lived. Um, I graduated high school early. So I was able to like, yeah, finish high school in my town. And then we moved and we moved from a huge acreage into a tiny little two bed bedroom apartment. My mom and dad and I, um, I was already pioneering at that point. So I'm like 17. Um, my dad's really sick. My mom's depressed. It was just, it was a really dark time. Like I, I don't even know how much I saw my parents for the next year. Like they were just, they slept a lot, like a lot. Wow. So yeah. how was your dad doing like physically with his illness? Was, was he? So bad. Okay. Yeah. He slept like all the time. And so the other thing was, this was really terrible too, because my dad had quit drinking when I was born. Um, he, like when my parents came in in the seventies, they quit drugs and smoking, but my dad didn't quit drinking till like nine years later. Hmm. So he had been sober for my whole life and he started drinking again. And that was, I mean, I don't blame him, honestly. I know he was going through a lot, like watching his daughter go through all this stuff and then his health and then moving and losing his job. And like, I, I honestly, now I, I just feel sad about it. Right. But mm -hmm. when I was 17 and seeing him drinking like that really, really affected me. And I was mad. I was really mad. <laughs> like I was you know, a little self-righteous, obviously, but. Well, sure. I, I mean, as you had been taught to be about it, right? You know, obviously he was probably escaping everything yeah. that was crashing down uh, yeah. into the bottle. But you, yeah, I, I can understand why you would have felt that way for sure. And, and uh, yeah. that's only going to make it hurt worse. I mean, it could already hurt and then it makes it hurt worse because now you have these moral judgments that are put on everything too by the witnesses and you're trying to strive and be this, you know, good little witness girl and pioneer mm -hmm. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. It flies right. Yeah. In the yeah. It was, it was a lot. And we, the town we moved to, um, there was a lot of witness kids, but they were all drinking and just, you know, kind of like whatever rebelling. I don't care now kids will be kids but I was super left out because I was looked at as this little you know goody goody <laughs> which yeah, I was. can't have the narc <laughs> coming to our parties who's gonna tell it on everybody <laughs> I really I probably wouldn't have done that but I was definitely they probably like, saw you that way though <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so I was pretty lonely like I my parents are going through this like mental breakdown my sister's back with her abusive husband who immediately got made into an ms oh boy so they made him a ministerial servant i wonder if they thought that that would because this is distorted <laughs> jw logic sometimes i think that they think it's gonna like make that person behave about yeah. giving them this title i mean it's just again super distorted so I know the abuser, but no, that could that could very well be. But we were all very mad. Oh yeah, like... rightfully so. That's again uh, just adds uh, 
insult to injury, right? Yeah. So like all this stuff's going on and I'm like determined to like prove myself because that's my brain, I guess. I don't know. Not wearing ball caps, that's for sure. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, <laughs> making sure of the important things right <laughs> exactly. but uh so then I go to my first pioneer meeting and I meet someone and he's from a elder pioneer couple family about an hour town like a town an hour away and I meet him in December and we start dating in February. So like, don't even know each other. Um, but I've just got stars in my eyes because he's a pioneer and I'm a pioneer. We're 18 years old. And that's the witness and, way. Yeah. His family's like, I just, I looked at his dad and I was like, Oh, I wish my dad was like that. Right. And yeah, that was a disaster, like so bad. Um, I'd never had a boyfriend in my life. I'm I was always boy crazy, like don't get me wrong, but I I just was like again being the great little witness that I was determined to be. And then now I'm 18 and I come home with a boyfriend, and of course my parents are like not happy about it, but I was like, I'm doing this, you know, another little mini rebellion, I guess. <laughs> well, but you're 18. Uh, you're a pioneer. Um, yeah. I don't know how they can stop you from dating, but I understand that they're not happy with it. They believe me, my wife's parents, I don't think were super happy about me. So I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um we dated for a year and a half um which is quite a long time actually mm -hmm. when you're a witness mm -hmm. um you know pioneered together he went to mexico for two months and his family took me down there and we went in service in mexico and you know like on on the surface everything looked so rosy not that like anyone was really impressed that we were so young getting married like we but everybody kept being like when are you getting married at the same time <laughs> oh that's right there's a second you uh sit next to uh a member of the opposite sex who's a peer or um hold yeah. hands or anything it's like so when's the wedding exactly yeah. exactly because of course you're going to marry the first person that you ever lay eyes on or have uh <laughs> have anything to do with yes exactly of course oh there was so many red flags like oh man i just i don't know what was going through my stupid little head but um like stuff like um he would fake sick in like public places and then i would have to like look after him just, just weird weird stuff or like he was hyper jealous um mm. i couldn't like talk to anybody else like even family mm. so controlling uh oh yeah you have found someone who is controlling yourself now mm -hmm. i think you think i was running from my mom and i just basically found the male version well i mean isn't that what most people kind of do um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just an unfortunate reality that you know, many of us end up repeating the patterns that because we know how to exist in that world, we don't know anything else. And I mean, if you're in Jehovah's Witnesses, finding a, a an abuser, I mean, <laughs> just throw a dartboard on a list of names and chances are you're going to find somebody who's pretty narcissistic or Whatever, um, right? I mean, it's it's kind of hard not to. It's it's the again, it's the witness way. It's narcissist leading codependence. It's a uh, it's the whole oh, way yeah. the system is set up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And 
so yeah, so uh, we got married and about two months in, we were having an argument. Of course, our relationship was extremely immature, 19 years old, you know. I hadn't even lived on my own, like, and uh, he slapped me across the face. Yep. That was uh, the beginning of the end. <laughs> that was the beginning of the end. So, well, I mean, first of all, I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, to follow that up, uh, you experienced that and found your voice or your whatever you needed to get out of that situation? 13 years later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, so there was there was just so much um, <clears throat> there was just so much abuse and control and sure. I mean, like, the fact that my sister ended up with somebody like that, too, and that was all going on in the background, too. She she finally got away from her ex, too, but... Mm. Well, it was um, very hard. I mean, you've been around abusers your whole life, right? I mean, your yeah. mom is pretty abusive, and the congregation, Jehovah's Witnesses, are abusive, and they churn out, sadly, very abusive young men at times. Yeah. And you met one of those. And so it's abuse to abuse to abuse. Mm -hmm. That's very, that's a very difficult cycle to get yeah. out of because they get their hooks in you in so many ways. It's, it's hard to break free from. Yeah. Like it was just, it's just weird looking back. Um, the stuff that I would put up with, like when we were newly married, um, we'd be, you know, at a table with other witnesses hanging out. And again, I'm still pioneering at this point. Um, and if I said something that he didn't like, or I was like, I could, I could be too happy. I could be too sad. It didn't matter. I was just never, never good enough, never good enough. And he would kick me under the table in a group of people, our, you know, give me a dirty look. And then he would like put me down in front of people. And then somebody said something to him about they didn't like it. So then he wouldn't put me down in front of other people. He would just do it in private. Mm -hmm. So it was just like nonstop, um, like mental fuckery. Sorry. No, no, don't <laughs> apologize. Um, cuss all you want. Um, so did you see signs of that behavior in the year and a half that you dated? Or is this, you know, because a lot of this is grooming and gaslighting, right? It's the oh, tools yeah. of the narcissist and then the blaming and, and everything, and all the controlling behavior. And that's mm -hmm. usually something that kind of comes on slowly as the relationship progresses and they just start being more and more who they are and mm -hmm. then you get married I, i've actually known of people who said they got married to a person and instantly they changed uh just a, a complete difference i definitely saw signs of it but i didn't recognize them because i think i was just so used to that like yeah like i said my mom was always swearing at my dad calling him names telling him he was lazy or stupid like i just I mean, <clears throat> I I guess I probably thought that was normal. Sure, it's bullying in its own right, right? Yeah. And and it's just one of those things that we were around. And, and and it's sad, but if you take a person who's used to that and you put them in a healthy relationship, a lot of times they'll sabotage that because they don't that feels foreign and they don't know what to do with that. And so, you know, sometimes we are attracted to the same type of pattern that we grew up with because it feels familiar. Yeah. We know how yeah, to live like, in that world. We've done it exactly. our whole lives. Yeah, exactly. So I'm true. I'm sorry that, that that happens. I'm very, very sorry. Yeah. Well, it gets worse. <laughs> okay. So it's progressive. 
Um, so we end up having, well, I had a miscarriage when I was 20, so I lost a baby. So then I quit pioneering after that and I kind of went into a depression, definitely a depression. Um, <clears throat> sorry. This whole time I'm married to a very immature young man. Um, he wouldn't go to meetings. He was looking at porn all the time, you know, I just, I felt so worthless and then I lost this baby and I quit pioneering. So now I'm just kind of like floating, right? Because I always made pioneering my focus. That was like, even though I hated service, <laughs> I just forced myself because it was the right thing to do, right? Of course. And then, of course. yeah, sorry. And then, um. Now I'm not a mom, but I want to be a mom, but I'm 20. And my husband is like, oh, so this is, the, this is another thing. So he was either mean to me or ignoring me. There was really not a lot of in between. Um, so I was always like trying to find a way to get him to like love me or even like me, you know? And I was young and beautiful and thin and athletic and fun and nothing worked nothing worked so he just would go off and hang out with young witness brothers all the time so he would I don't know he got like these air soft air guns or airsoft guns yep, air soft. and him and his yeah him and his buddies would go and like again now again I'm alone I'm just like trying to get his attention or get him to hang out with me even and <clears throat> I wasn't even working at the time but he's just always off with these like 14 15 year old boys he even started a lego club at one point <laughs> oh yeah I mean not that there's anything wrong people like no. what they like and that's fine no. but the but <laughs> The witnesses churn out some very, very immature young men. Yeah. And like, I get it. He was young. So was I. But I think I just, I was so determined to like be this perfect little wife. And he was just like, I'm out, you know? So anyway, I was like, well, we're having a baby then. And so we had our first son. And uh, so I'm like 21 years old, very young mom, but like just enamored with my little baby boy. And uh, so this is, yeah, there's so much going on here. I'm trying to think. So then his parents who built houses for a living and sold them were like, oh, we'll build a house with you. And so we built a duplex with them, but we had to live with them. For nine months. Okay, because you said it, we'll build a house with you, not for you. And that stood out to me. So <laughs> built a house that you all could all cohabitate in to some degree. Kind of. It's a duplex, it's a duplex. So we had our own side, but yeah. we're living with my in-laws when I am pregnant for the first time. We have no, you know, none of our own space, nothing. It was, it was really really bad idea <laughs> mm -hmm. so his parents are these elder pioneers in this really tiny little hall there was only 30 publishers so we moved there and now i've got my husband who's control slash of uh, ignoring me and two in-laws who are controlling me yeah and i mean like the level of self-righteousness in that family is like beyond explaining. It's like they would be like quizzing us on our study and like we, if we missed a meeting, like we were getting a lecture and we're like 21 years old, right? Married, first kid on the way, but. All yeah. the narcissism and control. You see where uh, he came 
uh, where he got it. Yep. And uh, so we built this house and now I've got a baby. <laughs> um, I've got a husband who is extremely immature um, and two in-laws right next door that would just come in our house without even knocking. I figured that, yeah. No boundaries. <laughs> no boundaries. <laughs> and my father-in-law is just constantly breathing down my throat, like, about everything. And, I mean, like, honestly, at that time, I don't even know what you could criticize. Like, I was, like, very modest dresser. I was at all the meetings. I was constantly commenting, giving talks. I was in service, you know, like I just, again, it was like living with my mother. Like I was just like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> well, there's handle. always something we can criticize a person for if we, if we want to. Right. I suppose. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's, that's what abusive people do. Um, yeah. I can only imagine how much that must've made you want to run. Yeah. Um, and around this time, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm so young. I'm so like, I have zero self esteem. I'm getting fat because I'm super pregnant. <laughs> and my husband doesn't want to spend any time with me just wants to sit and play video games and hang out with his you know 14 15 year old buddies and so he started pressuring me into some things that I was like super uncomfortable with um he basically I don't even know how to say this um he basically coerced me into like anal sex constantly um, like I'm pregnant, so a, it's really painful. Like it's not, and I didn't know what to do. Like, I just, I just felt so trapped. I, I just wanted to make him happy. And then he would be like nice to me for like a day after. <laughs> and I just, yeah. So, um, recently watched the, uh, Sounds like a weird segue, but it's not. Uh, I recently watched the Amazon documentary or whatever you want to call it, the four-part miniseries about the Duggars. And uh, it's mm -hmm. called The Shiny Happy People. And they were talking about the, was the IBPL, I think, is the group that they came from. And okay. one of the things they talked about, and Jehovah's Witnesses are the same, and I mean, here we are, is you know, when you teach these girls well teach anybody really that they can't say no mm -hmm. when, when were you ever allowed in your life Tara to say no now here you are um in this again misogynistic patriarchal organization and your husband is pushing things on you that you want to say no to you've never been allowed to say it there is no saying no inside the organization. You say no to yourself. You're taught to say yep. no to what you want. No to ball caps. No to you know silly <laughs> you know silly trivial. Like if if you can't even do that, what are you going to be able to stand up for and say that say yes or no to? You know, there's um, it gets to <laughs> consent and within the organization. I, I don't think they, they never talk about consent, rendering to each one their due. There's just like this expectation of yes to whatever. And it's really, really damaging. So I'm sorry. Yeah, it was. Um, <clears throat> it, it was so hard. I honestly constantly felt like I was just like dirty, like inside. And mm -hmm. And the other thing was that, like, I didn't really feel like a woman. Like, I just, I was like, what, what is the point of having a wife? You know, if this is what you're forcing on me, I don't, I don't know. I, I felt so worthless, but I'm still trying to, you know, look like the perfect witness couple on the outside. Cause that was really important to my in-laws. We always had to look 
like the perfect witness couple, same with, you know, that's how I grew up. Everybody had to look perfect and spiritual and all about appearances. Yeah. It's just, let's make the abusive husband of your sister, a ministerial servant. Yeah. It's all about appearances. In the meantime, she had finally left him, thankfully. Um, before I even had my son, she had left him and got away from him. And, and then it was found out later that he was beating the kids also. So, yeah. But you know what the crazy thing about that is? He got reinstated within four months of cheating on my sister. And now he's anointed. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh boy! Well, first of all, four months—that's nothing. Four months is nothing to to be to be out for. I can't believe he got reinstated that fast. Uh, and then to, and then of course now Jehovah has chosen him as one of yeah. his. Uh, I guess it's not faithful, discreet slave anymore. That's only the governing body, but one of his chosen anointed ones. What a special, special person he is. Yeah, hasn't paid an ounce of child support. You know, my nephews are 26, 24, and 23 now, but, you yeah. know, he's anointed. Well, he can go up there and serve. They all deserve each other. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, boy. Yeah, well, we all laugh about that one. That's for sure. That's... Um, so, um, I guess to continue on sure. with the saga of just awful things that have happened. Um, so I basically insisted that we moved because I couldn't, I couldn't handle his parents anymore. Um, especially his dad, just like this. Ugh. Yeah. Super controlling person. Mm -hmm. So we moved to a different town. Um, we had a lot of people our age in that town. So um, young families, young couples. Um, and my ex, my husband at the time, um, he started drinking really heavily. He had always drank, um, every day he drank, but now it became like, you know, I would hear him get up in the morning and I would hear the bottle swig before work. And then sometimes I would come home and he'd be home at lunch drinking. It was just, yeah. It got so bad that you, so we used to play hockey. Like we had a, like a little witness hockey <laughs> group that would play. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I always loved to play hockey. And so we had a little group that would play together. And if I was sitting beside him on the bench, you could smell the alcohol coming out of his pores. Mm -hmm. So he's abusing me in every way. Um, I'm still, you know, toeing the line, making sure everything looks great from the outside. He's drinking all the time. Um, the young couples in our hall, we kind of all kind of drank together at some points, you know, nothing too crazy. There was some parties that happened and we got in trouble, but, um, everybody, everybody drank like a lot, but my husband he was drinking like so bad like so much and so my life is just chaos like by this point we'd had another kid so I've got a toddler and a baby um I am trying to keep it all together I'm at all the meetings I'm in service he's doing his thing as usual um and then he really like went off the rails so he tried to choke me to death at one point um I ended up filing three charges of abuse and he got charged and he didn't get any discipline are you talking about from the witness discipline okay okay yeah sorry sorry you filed so the charges in a legal setting or you... yeah he was charged by the police okay and then the you're saying that then congregationally he yeah. was, nothing happened yeah so 
the day I went to court, um, he's there with his dad. I'm on the other side because they had put a restraining order on him. The police had. And uh, an elder from our congregation is sitting beside me. I guess he had got some little fine or something. He'd gotten wood off of mill property or something like that. So it wasn't like a huge deal. But he was at court, right? Because it's just open. Like everybody can go and like listen to everybody's dockets. And I'm sitting there by myself and this elder looks over at me and he's like, why are you here? And I was like so distressed at that point because I had just, it, it was just, it was just an awful situation. I'm there by myself and I just blurted out, oh, he's getting charged with three counts of assault against me. And he kind of like jaw drops and then, you know, he, his stuff was done. And so he left. So he went to the local elders about it. Um, and then they questioned me. But my husband's dad swooped in from his congregation and stopped him from getting even reproved. So, yeah. It's just Jehovah's organization for you. I'm so sorry. Uh, there's just no, I mean, yeah. I mean, what are they really going to do anyway, but slap them on the yeah. wrists? Like at that point, I didn't really think, cause I took him back and, and we got back together, but I didn't really think, Oh, why isn't he getting disciplined? Now I do. I'm like, I don't what, like, how did that, mm -hmm. you know, at that point I was just, when you're in an abusive situation like that, like your brain doesn't, it doesn't operate like a normal person's brain. Like you're just, you're just in constant chaos and survival mode. Well, sure. I mean, again, so, I mean, just how many of us who've left Jehovah's Witnesses look back and are like, I can't believe that I did this or I did that, or I believe that, or I put up with that. I mean, we can all relate to a lesser degree. I mean, it's different when you're living and this is your partner, you know, I'm not equating it entirely, but I'm just saying that we all, you know, have been in abusive situations where we look back and it's like, wow, I can't believe I was there. Um, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I'm sorry that was you. So, so the, 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 you said the elders didn't do anything. Did the charges stick or anything when you went to court? I mean, did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was, yeah, no, he didn't deny it. Oh uh, no, he didn't deny it in court. Um, he went to like a twelve-week um, counseling kind of thing, mm -hmm. and I, it actually it helped him. Um, plus, they charged him to stay sober, so he had to stay sober for a while. So things got a little better in that sense, and so I stayed. I stayed with him, and. And then slowly over time, things just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And yeah, I, I mean, like I think back and it's like, it's very hazy. A lot of it. it's kind of like, like I said, I was just, oh. yeah, I was just in survival mode and I've got two little kids um, and just trying to keep up appearances constantly. like everything's fine. I'm fine. You know, like, <laughs> so my mom and dad, they obviously knew about the charges and they, they were worried about me for quite a while too. Um, they had seen my sister go through it. And I think everybody just kind of could tell that things were really bad. Um, my husband would even like corner me in a room before my family would come over and like tell me what I could and couldn't say. And so it was just, yeah, he wouldn't let me go to the grocery store because I couldn't have control of money. Um, There's so many, so many weird things like, yeah. Um. Anyway, I'm trying to think of where. So, okay. So that's then, then we ended up, 
um, he wasn't working enough where we lived. We lived in a mountain town. It was quite expensive where we were. Mm -hmm. So we moved back to the little town where his parents were. And I was fine with that. You know, I was older at this point and I'd kind of learned to just ignore their controlling behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had some friends there too. And so you anyway, weren't living with them again, right? No, no, yeah. no. Sure we, numbers. yeah, we had uh, we had owned our own home for quite a while at this point, so we bought another house, and um, yeah, things were okay. But if I thought he was drinking a lot before, well, <laughs> it got worse. <laughs> So he was just basically permanently drunk. And his because it was a small congregation, like 30 publishers, his dad had him on stage like every meeting. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> and his dad had him on stage. So is his dad like the presiding overseer or the coordinator of the body of elders or whatever at that time? Yeah. Yeah. There was only two elders there. Hmm. And he'd been there for like. This is why he hasn't gotten in trouble for things. And uh, okay. Yeah. So I'm in the, you know, audience with my two little boys and my drunk husband is on stage. And in the meantime, he's raping me and trying to choke me while we're being intimate. And, you know, I looking at porn and drinking constantly and I'm just sitting there just honestly I was just a shell of a human being for that entire period of my life yeah so sorry that's um yeah like shell of a human being I think that's a good way of saying it because they the do just wear you down and take everything from you until you have have nothing left and it's yeah like, and like after you know and I was still like so trying to be faithful you know to Jehovah and so like after he would be abusive I would sit on my couch and cry and pray and I would just beg Jehovah like Jehovah please help me for like hours I would just beg him and beg him and beg him and all this time I'm going to meetings I'm going in service I'm raising my kids to be witnesses you know and nothing changed nothing changed I had talked to the elders so many times I had been suicidal um I swallowed an entire bottle of pills one time you know like Thankfully, I didn't succeed, you know, and I always would think about my kids. That was the the one thing that always kept me going because I knew that would be so awful for them. I couldn't do that to them, you know. Um, I didn't ever want to hurt them that way. So I just kept putting up with this and not not knowing what to do. I honestly just wished he would die. Like, I just wished he would drink himself to death so that I could be free. (laughs) Because I wasn't willing to cheat on him. I was still like this. I had this faithful little, like, good girl. (laughs) Well, and I just want to point that out. Um, You said you didn't want to cheat on him. Um, Excuse me, Jehovah's Witnesses make it right like that's the only way out of a marriage, right? That that's kind of what they float out there, and so people just don't even think. Well, I could just leave. Yeah, exactly. Right? I guess it's like, well, I mean, I have to cheat on him because that's the only way to get out. And mm-hmm. a lot of people end up doing that to get out because that is what's been drilled into their head the whole life is that the only way to dissolve a marriage is for it to be dissolved in a sexual nature like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, there's been people that I I think I've had on the podcast whose uh, spouse was like, "Eh, I forgive you. Come on back. Cause they just want to keep doing what they do. Right. 
Mm-hmm. They want to perpetuate the abuse. They don't want it to be over. Mm-hmm. And there's something exactly. they're getting out of it. So yeah, it's just, it's a, it's horrible. It's like, why don't people leave the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, because to leave costs you a lot and it's not something that you're ever really told you can do. You just, don't, you just think you can't. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's such a sick way to live. Like I just, it, it's it's not living. It's no, it's exactly. surviving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I'm not exactly sure what snapped inside of me, but um, I got to this point where, you know, they say that the opposite of love isn't hatred; it's indifference. Yep. Yeah. And I literally stopped caring. Not about the witness stuff yet, but about him. About him. I was I was just like, I I think detached. I Yeah, just I just became totally detached and for for about six months, like I just slept on the couch, you know, I avoided him. You know, at this point, he's not letting me even see friends in the congregation. You know, he's not letting me use my debit card. Like, I couldn't even put the kids in swimming lessons. You know, and they're like 8 and 11 at this point. So, I'm sorry, but kids need to learn how to swim. (laughs) It's just kind of... But they were apparently too expensive, even though they were like 50 bucks, you know. but. I just stopped caring and one day we were going to our cleaning jobs. So his family had all the cleaning contracts in this town, all the banks and yeah, of course. (laughs) So we're going to our cleaning jobs and he's drunk as usual. I got drunk that day too because I just got to this point where I was like, fuck this, like I can't do this anymore. And I don't remember what he said. And I, we, we, we was at the CN building. So that's the Canadian National Railway. Mm. So it's like their office. So it's right beside the train tracks. And I just took off and I started walking beside a moving train. And I was going to just throw myself under it. I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with anything and I was like well if he's not gonna die and I'm not gonna sleep around and he's not gonna sleep around then I guess I have to go and that's sick to think that way but that's what was going through my head look desperate for a way out and not blind to the ones that are out there because of the conditioning yeah so I'm walking beside this train and I just kept thinking of my kids And so I saw a car driving down the road and I like ran basically towards this car and I flagged them down. It was this older lady. And I was like, I'm not going to hurt you. Can you please just take me to the hospital? Like, I just, I need to go to the hospital. I am not safe. I'm, you know, not dangerous, but I just need to go. So she took me, dropped me off at the hospital and the doctor I saw was really good. And, um, I had a friend in our town a witness friend that took me in and so for two weeks I told him I don't want any contact like I don't want to talk to you I don't want to see you I'm just gonna like stay here and try to figure out what's going through my head so I did that and then I decided I wanted to separate um thankfully his parents were out of the country at the time they were in Israel doing some missionary stuff and uh yeah of course (laughs) of course they're missionary of course you know yeah they were i don't know Mm -hmm. anyway so he i said you gotta go stay at your mom and dad's i i need i need a break from you like i don't want you at the house of course he wouldn't take no for an answer he was constantly at the house anyways so (laughs) My conditions were you need to stop drinking, you need to look after your mental health, and you need to like figure out something to do with your anger issues. Those are my three conditions. 
So he quit drinking and we had decided, oh, we're going to keep going to the meetings just to, you know, keep some continuity for the kids. <laughs> and uh, comes over to the house to get his suit and has a seizure right in front of me. Mm. So like an alcohol withdrawal seizure. Mm -hmm. So I'm on, you know, I, I called 911, you know, tried to keep him safe. The kids are in the other room bawling. I'm trying to keep them out so they don't have to see this. And he got his license taken away and all that. And one night I was like, oh, I need to go get a board game from my in-law's house. He was staying there. So I was like, I'll just go, go get one. I go to the house, the door's open and he's passed out on the couch. And there's like a 60 of rye gone. And I was like, nope, not doing it anymore. So I called my mom and dad and my brother and they basically came. We packed up my, you know, basic belongings, clothes, kids clothes, toys. I didn't take any furniture. I had nothing. And I went to live with my mom and dad for a month. <laughs> and they let you. They did this time. <laughs> okay. Okay. And the elders let you. Because let's not, you know, not leave them out of this. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm like, I've got super bad PTSD by this point. Like I'm waking yeah. up with nightmares all night and like visibly shaking. I've got such bad anxiety. Um, go to the circuit assembly and I see people from another a hall that I had lived in with him. They won't even talk to me. I'm not disfellowshipped. I'm not, you know, reproved, nothing. But of course, word gets around in small town. That you left. That I left. So you're the bad one, right? Yeah. 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 And I, I'm not going to go and tell people. Like, I'm just sitting there with my dad and trying to get through the day. And I'm like, really? Like, I've known you for 20 years. And you're not even going to come say hello? Like, <laughs> just so messed up. So messed Aw, up. the pre-shunning. The pre-shunning, yes. That's. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I managed to stay with my parents for a month, which was absolute hell. <laughs> um, because my mother, she was, she was mad at me. Like, this is the weird thing about being a survivor of abuse is that sometimes it's like you have a target on your back it's mm -hmm. it's like my mom was mad at me that I didn't leave sooner <laughs> you know no matter what you did again it wasn't gonna be right no and then here's the other messed up thing so my sister's like oh let's I'll take you to Mexico this is a month after I left my my husband she had a timeshare and she said all you have to do is pay for your flight so I had a little dirt bike. I sold my dirt bike and I managed, to, and I was super excited because it's like my big sister, you know, we were always pretty close. Um, I hadn't been on a vacation ever. Well, I went to Mexico sure, when I was 19. That's not true. But anyways, um, so we go to Mexico and my sister's like, I don't know. She, she was just like weird from the get go. Like, she she had to bring her Bible and her publications to the beach and was like, <laughs> it's just weird. I, <laughs> who takes their Bible and their publications to the beach? Good Lord. Again, as I've said many times, being a witness, you know, you, your addiction, there's an addiction. Every witness is addicted to being a witness. Know. You know, and it's like they can't get, can't even get away from it at the beach. You can't even stop for a second without getting a hit. It's crazy. I know. So I'm like, again, like I mentioned, I have really bad PTSD at this point. So I'm yes. 
I'm just trying to relax. I brought a novel, you know, mm. I'm like, oh my God, I'm with my sister on the beach. We can have, a, you know, a margarita. We can float in the pool. Like we're just like, this is the best, right? Like I'm so stoked, right? Yeah. I needed this. I needed this little break from reality. Um, and, and by this time I had already like gone to court twice to like, make sure I got custody of my kids. And I'm, you know, I had gotten a, um, fleeing domestic violence fund. So like, I was like doing all the stuff. I got a full-time job. Like I was a month after leaving my very abusive over a decade relationship. I'm just like, you know, out to prove myself as usual, And, uh, and now I get to go on a, you know, eight day vacation with my sister. So anyway, like I said, it kind of started out weird. It was like, she was, she was mad at me too, right. That I hadn't left. And even though she had come from an abusive relationship, it was like, she blamed me. So three days into our vacation, my sister's like constantly preaching at me and I'm not really even sure why, but you know, that was, <laughs> but we, you know, we'd, we'd had some drinks on the beach and like everything was fine. Nobody was, you know, like drunk or anything. We were just, just the two of us hanging out. We head back to the hotel and it's like probably 10 30 at night by this time. So I'm like, okay, let's wind down. Let's go to bed. And she just got like weird. She she started like getting mad at me that I hadn't left. And then she got in my face and she was like, everything that's happened to you is your fault. And if anything happened to your kids, it's your fault. And I mean, like this just came out of nowhere. So I, I'm like, what is happening right now? So I went to the balcony I'm like trying to like calm myself down. I'm like, okay, like just let's diffuse the situation. You know, like this doesn't need to happen. So I went back in and she told me she was going to get my kids taken away from me. Wow. <laughs> and, and I like, like got really mad and I yelled at her. I don't remember what I said. So she slapped me across the face and called me a little bitch. Oh boy. Yeah. So your sister didn't fall far from the narcissist tree. Nope. (laughs) Wow. I'm so sorry. Yeah. This is just supposed to be a little escape for you. And now you've just been isolated again with another abusive person. Yeah, I basically spent the next five days avoiding her as much as I possibly could. But then in our hotel room at night, she would call her husband and complain about me loudly so I could hear her on the balcony. And I mean, like, honestly, that night that that happened again, I was like ready to throw myself into the lagoon. Like, I was like, I can't, I don't. Yeah, I don't even know how to explain to this day. I mean, that was five years ago. I just feel sick. Shocking. Yeah. Absolutely shocking behavior. I mean, I don't know if she's projecting her own stuff from her own relationships or what, but I mean, it doesn't really matter. The why is not as important as the what and how it makes you feel. And I mean, that's, I mean, it's just entirely abusive behavior and, uh, wow, that's, that's yeah. just disgusting. I mean, my mom used to slap me too, so I'm not sure she slapped my sister. I don't know. I don't, so this anyway. She's obviously not well herself. No, God, no, no. Um, my mom actually drank a lot when she was pregnant with her before they became witnesses, so. I don't know if there's a little FAS there. I couldn't tell you exactly. It's never been diagnosed. I'm pretty sure my mom has bipolar, but that's never been diagnosed either. So I don't know. I mean, there's just a lot of like stuff that 
throughout the years, I had, I don't know, just, I thought everything was normal until I actually can see it from a different lens now. Like it's, yeah. I mean, you, you grew up surrounded by people who were ill and mm-hmm. um and yeah you know it affected you and i'm well happy to be talking to you now yeah. um, and that you know that illness didn't end up taking your life too because it very well could have and um i'm yeah it's just uh sorry. yeah yeah, thank you. I mean, it's uh I don't know, it it feels pretty surreal when I look back at everything. Um but there's more. Don't <laughs> wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I laugh because I think it Oh, I get it. <laughs> okay. I get it. I mean, a lot of us with dark senses of humor have gone through some really messed up things and that you know and it's part of our own coping mechanism so exactly and that no worries okay um so that all happened the mexico incident i like to i like to call Mm -hmm. it um so obviously i'm not really on speaking terms with my sister i'm like "Mm, yeah i'm good like let's just let's take a let's take a breather here Sure. Um, I need to kind of folk I need to focus on getting back on my feet, you know, looking after my kids. Um, and of course I'm going to try to stay in the truth, you know, because right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's been such a blessing so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so I get my own little apartment. I get a full-time job at a pharmacy. And I am like pfft, super mom, you know, still got PTSD though. So that's fun. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. You know, but like I, I bounced back, got back on my feet. Um, I did get like, I did get help from people in the congregation and my parents, obviously with the kids, the kids were still young enough, needed some after school care and things like that. Um, and I'm going to meetings but I'm really struggling. Like I, this anxiety and this like waking up in nightmares is just, it's destroying me. Um, so I went back to old habits. I'm drinking. I'm, you know, still going to meetings, still getting my kids to school every day, making dinner every night, just, you know, like high functioning anxiety but I start having weird stuff happen. Like I would like wake up in a field in the middle of the night. And like, I don't know if that was PTSD and drinking combined, but it it was just, I was so, so anxious and so depressed. And I'm trying to get over my husband too, because I mean, you leave a marriage of 13 years. It doesn't just, even if it's abusive, you don't just get over it. Like I'm oh. super, yeah, I'm super depressed. I'm in my early thirties and thinking I'm going to be a spinster the rest of my life. He had gone to treatment twice by this point, And then he went back for two years. He was in a treatment center. Um, yeah. So I'm getting zero like child support, nothing like that. Just, you know, single mom life. And I'm lonely. (laughs) Of course I'm lonely. (laughs) And my mom is just still constantly harping at me about every little thing. You know, my kids never have good enough clothes and I'm not, I'm crying too much and it's upsetting them. And it's just like on and on and on. And I just can't even like cope with my own, nightmares at this point and trying to put a brave face on for my kids like you know I want them to be happy and that's why I left him right yeah like um so I ended up cheating on him 
Yep. I was like on my own for almost a year and I was just devastatingly like lost. Um, and at this point, I asked my parents to help me. Like, I was like, I need, I need something. I need to like, really like, I need a reset. So they found a center for people with PTSD. Um, it's about, it's a province away from us. So it's like probably a 12 hour drive. So they, my brother takes me and I go there for a month. It was very expensive. It was private, but my grandfather who wasn't to witness was very wealthy and they, they borrowed some money from him. So finally I am away from the witness BS for a month. No phone. I'm in therapy. I'm doing yoga. I'm in like art classes. I'm doing like meditation every day. And it was amazing. Like, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine what that must have felt like. It must have been quite the uh, well, treat. Culture treat shock. To, yeah, to be in a different <laughs> environment. Uh, you know, everything that you probably hoped Mexico was going to be. And <laughs> so much more, you know, <laughs> that you never could have even imagined because you've never been in that environment. No, I mean, I made a lot of friends. I was with sol ex-soldiers and people with like other issues like that. And yeah, we did workshops every day. And like I said, like they had a yoga studio, a gym, like mm -hmm. it was just, yeah, it was, but I mean, I, I was, I was so weird. <laughs> like I was like, I didn't swear. I didn't have any like you know, vulgar speech. Like I was just, people would laugh at me because I would always say for Pete's sake. <laughs> that is swearing, right? Sure. Well, of course. Of course. <laughs> that became like a joke. They're like, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I came home and I'm like, okay, I'll go back to meetings. I could not sit through a meeting. Why not? Well, I guess for lack of a better word, cognitive dissonance. Yeah. So you had gotten a minute away from it. You saw something healthy and then you went back to that unhealthy environment in the kingdom hall and realized, uh oh, the PTSD yeah. maybe isn't all just from these other individuals. Exactly. <laughs> Like, I remember sitting there, one of my first meetings back, and they're talking about the woman with the flow of blood yeah. and how Jesus helped her. And, you know, he was so compassionate. And and I just, like, just instantly started bawling. And I went out to my car, and I remember an elder who'd known me since I was a kid came out to talk to me. Just, he was being kind. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I spent my whole life, you know, putting Jehovah first, enduring an abusive marriage, enduring single motherhood, enduring, like, all this stuff. I begged God to help me, begged and begged and begged, and nothing changed until I did something. And he didn't have an answer. Maybe his God had gone to the privy. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. You know, uh, for all <laughs> those years, uh, he's been in the privy. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it is, but like, look at that. Or like, it's supposed to be such a beautiful moment that that woman wasn't made to feel unclean. Why yep. are we making women feel unclean in the first <laughs> place? Why, why are we sending them off and treating them that way? Like, why? why did he yeah. really do anything that special? I mean, come on. Yeah, just, true. You know, yeah. Yeah. So it I, was, I, I, yeah, I'm yeah. sure that he had no answers for you. 
No. No, and I just... I just decided at that point, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't, and I didn't fade. I, <laughs> so I was going to therapy for a year or two. Um, it was actually in, so I got this fleeing violence fund. And so um, social services, I applied to get counseling for me and my kids. And so they paid for a year of therapy for all of us awesome oh yeah amazing right like it would have I've never would have been able to afford that so it was really good I had a really great therapist she was just oh she was just amazing um and I told her I'm like I think I'm ready to like pursue another relationship but there is no way I am dating a witness like, no way. I cannot take that chance again that I'm going to end up with someone that I don't know what they're actually like in an intimate setting because it has been so damaging for me. I can't take that chance. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, she said, well, why don't you join a dating app that you pay for? Like, it's not just, you know, your free dating app. So I did. I joined a dating app. It cost me some money. Um, I was not going to meetings at this point. I wasn't, you know, nobody knew what I was doing. I never told my my parents, obviously, or my kids. Because <laughs> my mom and dad were still taking the kids to the meetings. Okay, yeah, um, I was wondering if there was retribution for you not going to the meetings. I mean... But I guess as long as they can get their your kids and think they're going to indoctrinate them, like that, the, they're good with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think I just kind of pass it off like I can't, like I'm too anxious to go. Mm -hmm. And my my mom and dad accepted that because they had seen my anxiety and you know firsthand. There's times they didn't go to the meetings, so who are they? To That's talk? right. Exactly. Exactly. So I I went on a few dates met some really nice guys like guys that had like money you know like nice vehicles were very kind to me I'd never been on a date in my life <laughs> like when, when you're a witness you don't date you're just no. in a public setting with a bunch of other people so it was pretty surreal to be like 33 and I'm like oh, I'm gonna go on a date you know um and then I met somebody that I was just I don't know. We just connected. And, you know, it's, it's so weird. You know, as a witness, it's always like, don't follow your heart. Don't follow your heart. Don't, you know, don't heart listen. Is treacherous. Who can know? Yeah. It? And I just knew, I knew this person was somebody that I was like, okay, I want to get to know them better. And so we started dating and we didn't tell anybody. We didn't tell the any of our kids. He's got three kids. I have two. Mm. Didn't tell any parents because I don't know, just wanted to make sure. And then finally I came forward and about four months we were dating and I came forward and I just, I went to the elders and I said, like, I'm not ending this, you know? And I knew, I knew what was going to happen. I mean, it didn't make, mean it was easy. It was a, yeah, it was, I, I knew that I was going to lose everybody. But you knew that by telling that if you went to the elders and told them what you were doing, that you were going to be disfellowshipped, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the shunning would commence. Yeah. You can't say you're repentant because here you are being like, well, I'm not going to change. Right. So yeah. yeah okay. And yeah. So you, did you have to go through the whole judicial committee process and everything, or did they just let you go? No, um, yeah, they, it wasn't like, I've heard other people's stories. It wasn't like I was asked a lot of personal questions, but I think it's because I made it pretty clear, you know, I wasn't, weren't repentant. <laughs> I wasn't going to end yeah. my relationship with this worldly guy, right? Like I had fallen in love and, <sighs> 
I, I didn't, I didn't feel bad about it at the time. I mean, I, I don't feel bad about it now either. Obviously I knew what that meant and it was going to be really, really hard. But I think I had reached this point with being a witness that I was just like, I need to get away from this. Like, this is a really toxic environment in every single way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. The relief that you feel sometimes when you walk away from even people that you're supposed to want to have in your life, or at least we're told that. Sometimes yeah. that relief says everything. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was never the kind of person that did anything half-hearted. So I knew at that point I had given my marriage 150%. Mm-hmm. And I had given being a witness 150%. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have any regrets about thinking I hadn't tried. Right. Oh, I yeah, you definitely gave them everything. Yeah. And my plan was, and this is nuts now when I say it out loud, but I was like, okay, well, I'll date this this guy, maybe we'll get married, and then I can go back. Mm-hmm. Right? Sure. <laughs> Makes sense from that point of view when you're in it, right? You're in that yeah. mindset. But in retrospect, yeah. Yeah, I was like, well. I'm going to go back to this thing that has been so (laughs) abusive and horrible in my life as soon as I get something good in my life. Now that I've found love that is real, well, now I can get married and be in love and I can also have my witness family back. Mm -hmm. Right? All my friends. Yeah. I... Yeah. Waking up has been a bit of a process for me. <laughs> it's a process for everybody. I guess. It's not an I event. Guess. It's not an event. Uh, waking up, healing, all of those things. There's not just one magic moment that changes it all for you. Yeah, I suppose, hey. Yeah, it runs deep. Yeah. You know, it's just like PTSD. You don't just, oh, well, that was traumatic. Oh, it doesn't hurt anymore. It had no effect on me. I don't repeat any patterns of this. You know, no, that's not how it works. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you know, we end up like moving in together. So that's tough because we've got a blended family and it, there's a lot to figure out. I'm still in my witness brain. Um mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember one night at the dinner table, I put a napkin on my head because I was going to say a prayer. (laughs) And my boyfriend looks over at me and he's like, don't ever do that again. (laughs) Use a proper towel next time. (laughs) The, The funny thing is, so his best friend, so they have a band, they're, um, they play in two bands actually in town here. Um, his best friend's wife is a JW mm. where we live. So he knows a lot about the whole stuff, but mm. he always was trying to convince me it was a cult. <laughs> and I was of course like, no, it's not a cult. And I'm, you know, <laughs> absolutely not. I can leave at any time and look at what happens. <laughs> Yes. So yeah, so the the shunning thing, he really, really hated it from the beginning. He just thought it was terrible and it yeah, it is. And um thankfully I've gotten to know a lot of people through him and his family and stuff. And his family's Catholic, so they're the worst, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> Dirty Catholics. Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses hated the Catholics. We always laugh about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but super awesome people. Like, oh my God. I don't know what I would have done without them for those last few years. So are you saying you've kind of been adopted into some other family, so to speak? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've had some, like, difficult 
years we've both been both had to go through divorces so lots of lawyers bills and <laughs> court dates and <laughs> dealing with um teenage girls and teenage boys and <laughs> just <laughs> it's been a pretty crazy few years um unfortunately the last kind of I guess crazy story I have to tell you <laughs> happened last year um so we've been together almost five years now mm -hmm. um, my family you know doesn't spend time with me obviously my mom would talk to me on the phone occasionally to do with the kids they always wanted my kids with them so like I'm sure yeah <laughs> And it's tough because, like, I don't want to keep them away from their family. But, like, my mom and dad would be, like, every weekend. We want the kids. We want the kids. Of course they do because they because want control. What? <laughs> they want control. Well, they, yeah, they want control. Jehovah's Witnesses are predatory. <laughs> they, they they prey on, they, they want children. I know people who have lost their kids to their parents um yeah and i mean so, like literally they they want just like your sister said i'm gonna get, take your kids they that i mean they prey on vulnerable people children are among the most vulnerable yep and that's exactly what almost well did happen last year mm. um okay. my fiance he worked at a, a mill in town here and had been there for over 10 years and got fired suddenly with like no cause. They gave him a severance. Um, interestingly, his ex-wife works at the same mill. Her boss is the one that fired him. Oh. We're not really sure it's, if it's related, but sure, sure. It's a small town, so sure, you never know. understood. Yeah. So he's out of work we've got you know lawyers bills through the roof because we've both been trying to fight for just it's just awful getting divorced is just terrible it's the worst um just like a lot of pressure that was on us for quite a few years but like we're happy together but you just have so much exterior pressure mm -hmm. and um we had a pretty bad month and I ended up calling my sister when I was drunk, unfortunately. And I said some things I didn't mean. And then my mom and dad kept coming, like they, they don't even live in the same town, but they would like show up at our house. Cause I was, I was having like, almost like PTSD, like came back. Yeah. It doesn't just, Really yeah good. right but it it, it was Flashbacks. under control yeah like so I was having panic attacks and I don't know if it's because mm -hmm. my husband my previous husband kept us so financially strapped and now I'm kind of in the same spot and I'm just like kind of I don't know I just, yeah I, I hate that word but yes that is no. exactly what it is and then my ex shows up at our house mm. and I never saw him I hadn't seen him in person for like three and a half years and I just like it was like nausea like I just so he wanted to take the boys for the weekend so I'm like okay we'll take yeah you're here like you drove like 12 hours to see them so of course even though you didn't give me any notice and yeah and all this stuff's happening my fiance's lost his job mm -hmm. you know I'm you know not coping at all I'm having panic attacks all the time and one night we had taken the dogs for a walk and we get back to the house and there's five cop cars in front of our house mm -hmm. and that day my ex-husband my sister and my mother went to a judge and told them that I was dangerous, that I was going to harm my children. And they took the kids, put them in the custody of my ex, and then they handcuffed me and took me to a mental 
health ward in a hospital. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I. They'll do what they need to do to get what they want, won't they? Yep. And I went to the hospital, had to walk through the whole hospital with handcuffs on. So humiliating. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Like, so humiliating. And uh, I was sitting on the bed and I'm just kind of like in shock. I, I didn't know, you know, and what to do or think. I was just like, how could this, how could this happen? Like, I'm a good mom. I'm not going to hurt anybody. Going through a hard time, not coping well, that's not like, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, the doctor came in, the ER doctor, and he sat beside me and he was like, so they, they, they make a form, basically a mental health form. So there's like level one to 10. They leveled me an eight. So like I was that dangerous <laughs> that they wouldn't even give me a plastic knife with my food. Okay. Just, this is based on the information given by your ex-husband, um, your yeah. mom, and your sister. Yeah. Who none of those people had spent even more than 10 minutes in my presence in the last four years. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's always witnesses. They know everything, though, anyways. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, um, apparently, my sister and my mom thought that they were going to get custody of the kids. They tried bashing my ex. But, of course, they're not going to give custody to the aunt or the grandma if the other parent is standing right there. Oh, wait a minute. Wait yeah. So they teamed up with, they were cool teaming up with them to get the kids away because he's an extra, you know, witness to how bad you are or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they turned on him too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, manipulators. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the hospital. The doctor comes in with this form and he's looking at it. He's looking at me. And he's like, why are you here? And I was like, you tell me. I don't even know what's happening. Like, I came home from a walk with my dogs and there was police. And he's like, well, did you run? He said, it says you were apprehended. I'm like, no, I just went with them willingly. Like, I'm not, I'm not a criminal. <laughs> he's like, huh. And then he points at my ex-husband's name on the paper. And he says... Was he controlling of you? I said, yeah, he even killed my dog one time. As a control tactic. Mm -hmm. And he said, hmm. He said, he's still controlling you, isn't he? And I was like, well, thank God somebody believes me. Hmm. <laughs> so... Anyway, he said, don't worry. He said, I'm going to make sure you get seen by the psychiatrist first thing in the morning. Um, and he said, you're, you're not, he said, you'll go home. Like, don't, don't stress. Cause the, the next step, if they deemed me, what's the word? Incapable or incompetent or something like oh, that. Mentally. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. We'll go with incompetent. Yeah, something like that. Then they would send me to, there's like a place not far from where I live that's like a mental hospital and it's lockup. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the goal that I would be sent there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, And it wasn't just your, uh, uh, it wasn't just your ex-husband who was still controlling you. Yeah. And I mean, of course, the judge is going to believe somebody that comes and is like, oh, of my course. daughter, my sister, my like, of course, they'd be like, oh, well, these people know her like. Well, yeah, they're not going to understand the situation here. No. So I got out. I saw the psychiatrist the next day. My fiance drove up the next morning because this is already. Oh, it was probably 2 a.m. by the time I got to this hospital because it's a drive. Mm -hmm. And. uh so he just did his assessment and, and wrote a report. And he's like, no, she's completely capable of, you know, looking after herself. There's no, you know, like there's depression and anxiety, but that it's not like I'm not dangerous. Yeah. 
<laughs> makes me laugh to even say that because like i'm like a super passive person <laughs> well gee why would there be depression and anxiety when you have those three people in your life <laughs> exactly. exactly so so then that started about an eight month court battle because um my ex got custody of the kids and now i had to prove that i was stable and my sister, so this got really complicated because not only was I fighting my ex-husband, I was also fighting my sister for custody. So there was two people saying that I shouldn't have custody of my children. And this is super devastating. Like I, I had never been separated from my kids. You know, they're in my entire world. And you had fought for them a lot. Yeah. Like so they were in a different province 12 hours away and I wasn't even allowed to see them. I got judge like the same judge every time. And he just, I don't know. He just really didn't like me. He was like, Nope, can't no visitation, no whatever. And I'm just like, it was devastating. It was the most devastating thing I've ever been through. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> I can't imagine. I mean, I, I, again, what did I say? They're predatory, you know, and uh, they will stop at nothing to get what they want. I'm so sorry. I mean, because it's not just hard on you. It's hard on the kids, too. Yes, it was right? very It's like, fun. do they really want what's best for the kids or do they want what they want? Right? They want what they want. They don't care about the kids. No, and like... I know the motivation was we're going to save these kids because mm -hmm. their mom's disfellowshipped and mm -hmm. if they stay with her, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. And I know that they think that because I've known my mom and my sister my whole life and their whole life revolves around Armageddon and the end is coming. And, you know, they didn't care. <laughs> it makes them do monstrous things. Yes, yeah. So um after finally finding a good lawyer, I did get my custody of my kids back. Um and their dad had hardly been in their life for the last four years anyway. So it was just crazy that they like I don't even know what they said in court, honestly, to this day. I don't know what they said. I wasn't it's not a matter pregnant. of record. No, it was a verbal record. Mm. So you have to request it and it costs money to get the transcripts. Gotcha. So. Yeah, I was going to say, I figured somebody, they usually have a transcriptionist or at least yes. in the American. Yeah. They do. Um, yeah, they do. It's just, I called and they said it costs so much per word. And I was just like, whatever. Absolutely. And really, does it, do you need to know? Is, it, is that going to make you feel any better? <laughs> No. <laughs> They're an upside to it. <laughs> no. No. So then, since then, things have been quiet. You know, like, we, my fiancé found work again. And, you know, we, we yeah. just focus on looking after the kids and trying to have good family time. And, you know, um, my parents contacted me a month ago asking to see the kids. And I basically told them, there is no way you're coming near my kids. <laughs> like, No, you tried to take my kids. Go fuck yourself. Exactly. And succeed. That's, that's, like, uh, you know, you tried to forcibly take my children. On what planet do you even think that I would be open to letting you see my kids? Who would? Yeah. But that's again, it's it's the abuse, it's it's how they are, it's how they how they get what they want out of life. Yeah. And and the, the crazy thing is when I when I did get to go see my kids um in the city they were living, I went for a weekend. That was the first time I'd seen them in four months. And mm -hmm. oh my god, I just broke down in the airport as soon as I saw them. I was just only imagine devastated. But anyway, um I didn't I've never really told them exactly, you know, and, and they're old enough too. They're 13 and 15 now. So they've seen a lot in their life. They're the poor kids. They've seen a lot of stuff happen with, you know, between their dad and I, and 
even when my, my youngest was like two, he would get in between his dad and me sometimes and try to protect me. And of course I remove, would remove him from the situation immediately. But I mean, my kids, yeah, they're, they're super resilient, amazing kids. I can't. Yeah. Anyways. Um, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. So you, you had gone to see them and it was very yeah. emotional. Yeah. And so we spent the weekend together and I took them to do a bunch of fun stuff. And I, when I was leaving that morning, I just basically said to them, you know, it's coming down in court between you're going to live with your dad or with your auntie or with grandma. I said, I don't know. Cause then my mom and my sister turned on each other at one point too. So, you know, just, just typical. Yes. That is just so, well, of course, of course they did. Of course they did. <laughs> well, then I got, got themselves. Oh my God. And my boys are like, no, we do not want to live with auntie. We don't want to live with grandma. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, you know what, no matter where you live, I will always love you. And I'll always have a relationship with you. You know, because I didn't, I didn't want to make them feel like they had to choose either. Um, but when they did finally get to come home, they were like, yeah, they, they both told a lawyer they wanted to come home. And so being old enough to make mm -hmm. up their own mind, you know, the, the judge did send them home, thankfully. So, yeah. Um so sorry that you had you and your kids had to go through that and again if i can i cannot say this loud enough for anyone listening but please 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 listen to these types of stories and unless supervised do not let your kids around jehovah's witnesses they are no. going to try to take your kids. They're going to try to influence them. Mm -hmm. I have known people who their kids at 18 bolted because they were secretly studying with like, you mm. know, mom's brother who was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And then, you know, their minds have been captured by this sibling, right? And then they they leave and they they go with that person or Whatever, yeah. I mean, they will try to influence your kids and take them from you. Jehovah's Witnesses are going to Jehovah's Witness. They're going to witness. It's what they do. It's in their DNA. And yeah. that is what they care about more than you, more than anybody else, yeah. more than themselves. They care about that thing. It dominates everything. And they want it to dominate your kids. So Bingo. please don't let them around them any more than absolutely necessary. And if you as a parent are there with yeah. strict boundaries about what can be talked about. Yeah. Well, and it's crazy because, you know, I'm so, I'm still so like um, groomed by my mother to just listen to her, like even in my thirties. Right. And so when, before this all happened, you know, my kids were constantly going camping with them and they're with my sister and my brother and all the, you know, witness crew and my fiance, his parents who are the Catholics, they're just like, mm, do you think they're spending like too much time with the kids? And, you know, kind of trying to like gently be like, maybe they don't need to be with them every weekend. And of course I'm working and I'm like trying to like Oh, well, I don't want the kids to miss out on family time or fun stuff. You know, it's just that mom guilt all the time. And my mom's guilting me. So double mom guilt, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and, and they were right. They were, they were right. I say this all the time. Your parents, so everybody is like, but it's family. Okay. <laughs> if you were in a family full of child molesters, would you send your kids over there? No, you would not. Just because it's a different type of abuse doesn't mean it's not equally damaging. Bing, yeah. and, and, and you got to be so careful with it because they will try to mentally do your kids in. Yeah. And it's crazy. And they don't mean, they, they think they're doing the right thing. I'll oh, say they that. Do. Yeah, but, they do. 
they're not like, oh, I'm abusive and this is my master plan, but they're caught up in an abusive thing that mm-hmm. makes them do abusive things. For sure. Yeah. I know the kids would come home and they'd be like, oh my goodness, grandma and auntie were fighting and I'd get a phone call from my oldest son and he'd be crying and he's like, grandma's yelling at me. And I'm just like, uh, like it was like having my childhood over again, you know, <laughs> just the constant chaos and yeah, but no, I mean, that's I, essentially the last year's been pretty good <laughs> like, oh, i'm glad to hear that you deserve a good year tara uh <laughs> like you deserve more than a good year but <laughs> a good year is a nice place to start right yeah. uh, you and your kids everybody you all deserve you you deserve good things you've you've certainly been through the ringer and um so i gotta ask so you mentioned so you kind of left there was a relationship things like that what about, so there's, a lot of people leave behaviorally mm-hmm. because they, they they want to act in a way that is not in line with Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, does not mean that there's anything wrong with it. Um, no. uh, but what about waking up mentally? You know, understanding yeah. doctrines, being able to understand not just that it was an unhealthy environment, but also, here's, you know, some of the things that are just blatantly wrong, learning about the history of the organization, things like that. Have you gone down that path? Yeah, um, probably in the last, yeah, in the last year. Or so, like, even before all that stuff went down with my family, you know, like, throughout COVID, I was doing, trying to do Zoom meetings and, you know, like... Uh, I was still trying to do all the things that I could and, you know, encourage my kids to, you know, accept the truth. And even, well, even I ended up splitting up with my fiance now because our divorces weren't going through. And I just constantly had this like Armageddon's coming. I'm going to die. The kids are going to die if I don't either, if we don't either get married or I go back right? So I ended up splitting up with him for about two months. And I wrote a letter to the elders and I was like, I'm coming back. You know, I've ended my relationship, but it was the wrong decision. Like I just, I knew that I was in love and I finally was like, no, I'm not, I'm not letting go of this, you know, this person that I've committed myself to, whether we're married or not, like I, we are committed to each other. Um, and so that fizzled out, but, you know, still again, just thinking that whole Armageddon's coming and we're all going to die. And mm-hmm. maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's Armageddon, why. the word that is mentioned one time in <laughs> revelation and the entire Bible, but is the means by which they have instilled fear into so many people over nothing. That, yeah. That's crazy to think. So yeah. Like I, I definitely just had this constant like fear. Mm-hmm. So have you been able to challenge that? Have you, you know, where did you find that you were able to start breaking some of that down? Because that belief system is like a virus that lies dormant in people. And then Mm -hmm. when something happens like a COVID or a Ukraine, Russia or whatever, Mm -hmm. then that, that fear that lies inside because we have these beliefs gets activated and suddenly we're sick again and we want to go back. Mm-hmm. That's, it's this thing that we have to root out have you what is what has helped you yeah so after all that well sorry before everything happened with my mom and my sister and mm-hmm. um i was watching this documentary on nexium <laughs> yep. you heard of that yeah, yeah. so I, i'm watching this and and i'm like man this is like you know I just kept getting these weird like vibes, like from the love bombing Mm -hmm. to the, like, nobody could ever do enough. Nobody could ever be good enough. Nobody could ever, 
you know, level up enough and they're just all working themselves to death. But then there's just this underlying like malice to it all. Right. But it's portrayed as this like really positive, like healthy environment. And I don't know if my spidey senses were tingling, but I think that just watching that was like a real kind of like, like something clicked. And I mean, I had been struggling to do Zoom Zoom meetings anyway. They're so, so bad and so boring. And I kind of, I think I stopped, I stopped going to Zoom meetings altogether. And then all that stuff happened with my mom and my sister. And it really made sense to me. Like the only reason they want to take my kids is because they think I'm dead. Like I'm done, you know? And then I ended up reaching out. So in our small town, there's someone that was friends with my older brother that's very active in the XJW, Mm. like, or like whole thing. And I, we just reached out to him. Like my fiance, he's had to go through a lot of stuff too, like understanding all this mm-hmm. garbage, right? That goes on and he doesn't get it. So it was nice for him to talk to somebody too. And he just kind of pointed us in the right direction. And I started researching, you know, pot, listening to podcasts and, and, you know, we would watch YouTube videos and like we'd stumbled upon your podcast. And, and it's just been like one, like, eye-opening thing after another like mm-hmm. and eventually you realized that what you were involved in wasn't even what you thought you were involved in like I was the kid in grade 11 explaining 1914 to my mm-hmm. classmates and when I found out that number was total bs I was just I was just like what <laughs> mm-hmm. how did I get how did I you know, I know how I got sucked into it. I was born in, but like, sure. how did I stay all this time? Like, and never research anything outside of it. Like, because you were afraid. <laughs> fear, fear and authority dominate everything in that cult. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You're terrified that your God's going to kill you. Mm-hmm. Then you're afraid to do anything that he might disprove of. And trying to constantly earn his approval, just like we did with our parents, right? (laughs) Or the congregation or whatever. And it's really freeing when you can walk away and realize that, you know, those people are abusive and that you don't need them in your life anymore. Yeah. uh, To have have a happy life. Yeah. I know. And like things I've seen, you know, my brother, he didn't get molested but almost like he got away from the situation by an elder's son and he was never disciplined it was just swept under the rug um same thing happened to my nephew like just it just goes on and on and on like the corruption i i so can't get are, over it so what are the fruitages of jehovah's organization yeah corruption <laughs> yeah corruption abuse Mm-hmm. destroyed families broken families yeah destroyed lives i mean it, it's not it doesn't produce fine happy fruit and i'm glad that you were able to to get away from it and to start waking up to those realities too uh, yeah so you, you could shake free and get you know your kids too i don't know how much they've been exposed to it but also to help them to understand too Yeah, well, they were definitely, I was definitely pretty gung-ho up until probably a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, But when I finally started, like, acknowledging that it wasn't healthy um, and I wasn't going back, the kids were relieved. They were like, we didn't want to be JWs. Good for them. Yeah. So, and I've always told them, you know, you, you have to make up your mind what you believe, but you know, that's okay. I'm not going to force you to believe something that you don't Mm -hmm. make sure you understand it. Make sure you do some research, you know, some soul searching, but I'm not going to force you. So 
yeah, we've we've definitely had a pretty pretty crazy year. We celebrated everybody's birthdays for the first time. Oh, happy birthdays to everybody. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, we celebrated Christmas, which was like so fun. Oh my god, I love Christmas so much. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um my boys joined a cadet army cadet program and they've just really excelled in that. It's a really awesome program. They learn lots of outdoor skills and discipline and yeah, it's, it's been really, really cool seeing them. They just both got awards last weekend for their work at cadets and yeah. That's cool. So what about, so your kids, it sounds like you're in, in, involved in some fun things, learning things, uh, and glad to hear they didn't, weren't really taking to that message from the cult. Um, so what about you? What's good about your life today? Uh, you say you got the holidays and such and your fiance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, we have a nice place. I'm not working at the moment. Um, I got really sick this past winter with pneumonia. I ended up like really sick. So anyway, I ended up losing my job because I missed so much work, unfortunately. Sure. But I've been able to take some time for the first time in my life. Basically, I haven't worked. So I've been able to take some time and just kind of rest and hang out with my dogs. And I've made a lot of new friends. Um, my fiance is really involved in our in the music community in our in our town and so i i just love now like I've, we've been together for four years so i go to these events and i just see all these people that you know like just treat me with such genuine kindness and they're always the same every time i see them you know whether it's been a month six months whatever you know it's just the same. Like it's, it's like actual friendship. It's yeah, crazy. No ulterior motives. They just like <laughs> you. They're not trying to get you to be like them. Yeah. And it's crazy. So we were at a music event this past weekend. It's a festival. And so I'm there with my worldly friends, you know, and hanging out and there's lots of witnesses in the crowd that I know. Um, so that can be a little awkward sometimes, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. but it but uh, I feel for the first time in a long time, like I, I really belong somewhere, you know, like I have, I have friends and it's good fun. Like we, you know, we dance and, you know, we hang out, we go to jams and, you know, camp and it's just, yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of things I want to do. But I think at this point, like I'm still rebuilding sure. my life and my self-esteem. Um, and I know it's going to take me still a long time to really recover from everything. <laughs> if I ever do recover. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. You'll, I mean, <laughs> as someone who works as a cult recovery coach, I, 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 I know you'll be able to recover over time, but you got to be patient with yourself and, and, yeah. and do the work, you know, and, and work mm -hmm. on these things and learning to trust others and learning yeah. to value and love yourself. You know, that's the one thing that we were never taught is to actually love ourselves. And uh, being able to really develop our own identity is super important. And as, yeah. you, as you're doing all of these things and finally maybe being in a safe space for the first time in a long time to do that, mm -hmm. you know, you'll you you can get there for sure for sure yeah. and and I love what you're already doing that you're already getting some community around yeah. you and, and things like that those are good things yeah um, and now yeah, owning your own awesome. story that's another good thing yeah I mean I've told bits and pieces of it but never the full thing I think it I hope it makes sense I mean sure. it does yeah Oh, yeah. I'm sure many other people will. Unfortunately, I'm sure there are a lot of other people who can identify with some of the things, particularly probably some women who also were in similar relationships. And, you know, it's it's good to see. You know, one of the things I love at the end of these episodes is talking to people about where they are today. Yeah. Um, 
And it kind of runs the gamut. You know, you have people who are farther down the path, who are farther away from it. You have people who are right in the middle of it. Sometimes people are really still struggling. And that's uh, that's one of the things that I find beautiful about it is that everybody's in the place where they are today. And we've all been in those various places. But over time and with continued work and not just denying it and acting like it didn't happen, and we actually look at it and we work on it. Yes, we can move past this stuff and we can have a, a truly meaningful and happy life uh, with people who actually care about us and not themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to look at how the witnesses behave now from my perspective and how different, you know, I was always told, oh, the world is so dangerous and it's so, it's so you know, terrible, and you're just going to end up a drug addict. And I have met some of the most genuine, amazing, talented, inspiring people. And I get to call them my friends. And they just like, I like to paint. So I've, I've done some painting, I've sold some things over the years. Yeah. And I've done some art shows too. But um. I just have so many people that are just like so interested in that. And I just think of myself as pretty amateur, (laughs) (laughs) but my friends, you know, they're like, Oh, we love your artwork. And you know, it's like, Oh yeah, I have a personality. Mm -hmm. I'm not just a witness. (laughs) No, you're Tara. (laughs) That's right. You're not sister, you know, whatever your maiden name was or whatever you're, you're Tara. Uh, and 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 that's awesome and we of course it's normal for ex-jehovah's witnesses to discount what they do and to have a hard Mm -hmm. time taking compliments and so on (laughs) and so forth Uh, which is just an indicator of you know isn't it funny you were told that the world was gonna be such a horrible place by the horrible place that you escaped (laughs) from right yeah exactly projection masterful yeah. projection as part of the gaslighting and and so i'm glad that you're waking up to all this and and i'm glad that you are finding yourself in a, in a life that fits you and again people that care about you um to wrap things up um is there i'll just ask you would you like do you have uh an instagram an art something that you would like to share because uh, maybe others would be interested in that or Maybe your fiance is banned. Do you have anything you'd like to share? Sure. Um, my Instagram is art by Tara Worthing. Okay. Art by Tara, Tara Worthing. W O R T H I N G. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't have a space to paint in right now, but um, I have some things on the go I'm going to try to get done. <laughs> Sometimes I like to start and then I don't finish them right away. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. That, I mean, uh-huh. I think it's <laughs> that kind of, you know, being an artist, right? <laughs> A lot of creative individuals are like that. Um, what about your fiance's uh, bands or whatever, if he or you would want to share that? Yeah, absolutely. So he's in two bands. Mm-hmm. Um, one is called Analog Smoke Show. Okay. And the other one is called Beauty and the Beats. <laughs> I like that name. Yeah. They just, Beauty they just and the Beats. Um, yeah. Are they, can can that be found, those bands be found on like Spotify think, or SoundCloud or? No, just Facebook. Facebook? Um, they mostly just do live stuff. They don't. Okay. You know, we have, they have recorded some things. I write some songs too. And then my fiance puts music to them because <laughs> I like to awesome. I like to write. Yeah. Look at you learning to express yourself authentically <laughs> and not having to hide yourself. That's awesome. There we go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you telling your story, Tara. And I know it's going to help other people out there. Thank you. I, I really hope so.